Hello and welcome to this Let's Chat Wheeled Vehicle. My name is Karen Emmons and I'm a VASO board member, one of the technology event group leaders and a national event supervisor. I'm accompanied by Ethan Gom. Ethan is a fourth year at UVA. He did SO in high school doing the vehicle event in all four years and has been an event supervisor for vehicle events for VASO. We're lucky to have someone with us who has expertise on the vehicle events from both sides. And a special thank you for a college student getting up early on a Saturday morning to do this. As we get going, I encourage you to put your questions in the chat and I'll keep an eye on them to make sure that they get asked. One note before we start, in our time this morning, we cannot possibly cover every rule or situation in the rules or VASA clarifications. Nothing we say here today supersedes rule or clarification. You will still need to read the rules. Read the rules often because every time you do, you'll see something else and then read them again. And don't forget about the VASA clarifications on the website, which are as binding as rules. I know we have a lot of parents on today. Please remember that Science Olympiad is a hands-on activity for students and hands-off activity for parents. Students must build all parts of the vehicle that they bring to the tournament, but parents can and should teach tool skills and safety. They can help students think about what should go in a practice log, and parents can be a sounding board and can lay out practice track and be practice timers. Finally, this is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel and on the appropriate event page on our website. I welcome now Ethan. Ethan, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Thank you for having me. So tell us, what is the task for Wheeled Vehicle? Sure, so the task of this for this event is to build a car, which is powered by um, elastic potential energy, uh, but specifically not elastic potential energy stored in a metal spring. Um, and to make that car so that it can drive a very specific distance and stop as close to a target point as possible um, in as short a time as possible. Um, what does the vehicle, so bro, how is this score? What are the, what are the, the, the things that go into a vehicle event score? Yeah, so there's basically two components to the score, which is your time and your distance. So, um, a portion of the track, which we'll cover in a little while, um, will be sort of the timed section of the track. And you are given points based on how quickly your car can traverse that portion of the track. And so the quicker your car moves through that portion of the track, um, the lower your time score will be. Um, and in addition, the stopping point that your car stops at um, will be measured, the distance from that stopping point to the target point will be measured, and that will give you a distance score in centimeters. Um, and your final score is a formula. Uh, it's the summation of the distance from the target point and two times your time score um, in seconds. So you want, so in this event, kind of counter, you want a low score. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> okay. So anything that adds to the score is a bad thing in this event. Mm -hmm. um, all righty. So why don't we start then with the track? Because the, the, the track's a bit confusing. Mm -hmm. You have an exhibit to show, right? Yes. Um, so the Science Olympiad Nationals website includes this diagram, and we've actually added it, or Karen has added it to um, the uh, to the Virginia State Science Olympiad website as well. Um, let me actually show you how you can pull up this diagram. So um, starting from the Virginia Science Olympiad website, um, you can go up to middle and high school at the top and then events, and then scroll down to wheeled vehicle at the bottom. Um, and at the bottom, there are two PDFs. One of them is construction parameters, which we'll be looking at, and the other is the track PDF. Um, so this illustrates what the track looks like. Um, the, at the bottom of the page, we have a starting point, um, which is where your car will begin. 
um, and the car should attempt to travel in a straight line down the length of the track and stop as close as it can to the ending point. Um, the precise distance from the starting point to the ending point will not be known prior to the day of the competition. So um, at regionals, uh, the total track distance will be um, set in an increment of 0 0.5 meters, um, which means it will be either 8 meters, 8.5, 9 meters, 9.5, et cetera. Um, and then in the middle of the track, we have these two green tapes, which designate the timing zone. Um, and that will always be the same length. It will always be seven meters long. And that represents the portion of the track that your car is actually being timed for. So timing will begin when your car crosses over the first tape here. Um, and it will end when the car crosses over the second tape here. Um, and I believe in Virginia, we will be using photo gate timing systems, which use a laser to detect when the car crosses the first line. And then again, when the car crosses the second line, um, which will give us a very precise measurement of how long it takes to, to traverse this portion of the track. I think that's it. All right, anybody have any questions on the track? I'm just gonna take a quick look over here. All right, that the, I will note that the, the late, the photo gates that we use, we will try to put as far apart as possible. They'll certainly be, that, that tape that goes down on the floor is 70 centimeters long. Um, and they'll certainly at least be that wide, but you know, we'll put them as far apart as they work. You, you know, there is of course a, a maximum distance that you can put photo gates apart before they won't detect the lasers anymore, so. All right, uh, let's let's move on. Actually, let's let's ask this question now. So, Ethan, what happens if a car hits a photo gate? Um, so, there's no official penalty in the rules um, for if a car runs into a photo gate. Um, we will be using a backup timer. So, in addition to timing the car with a photo gate, there will also be a human there with a stopwatch that will be timing it. And so, if something happens, like a car hitting a photo gate that prevents us from um, using the photo gate measurement, we'll be able to fall back on that manual measurement. Um, generally, the, generally, the photo gate should be treated like an obstacle. So you don't wanna hit them if your car hits a photo gate and that prevents the car from arriving at its target destination. Um, that's just you know how it goes. Um, you don't get like a redo on the run or anything. Um, so you should do your best to keep the car as close to the center line as possible so that it doesn't run into the photo gates in the sense. We've had a couple of questions here. Is the distance away from the target point, so that blue tape at the top, mm -hmm. uh, in any direction? So are they measuring it? What, what's the direction of measurement here? Right, so the target point will always be placed um, along this imaginary center line, they call it. Um, so it'll always be in a direct, a directly straight line from the start point. So you shouldn't need to design your car to be able to turn or curve or anything. It should just be designed to go in a straight line. Okay, the target point, we're not talking about start point, Ethan, the target mm -hmm. point, the ending point. Yeah, right, when exactly. So, so the, there's an imaginary line drawn from the start point um, through the target point, which will be a straight line. So the target point will always be in the center of the track. It won't be off to the side. Right, but when the vehicle stops, how do you measure the distance from the vehicle to the target point? Oh, I'm sorry, maybe I misunderstood the question. Um, so the the we'll go into construction parameters in a little bit, um, and we'll talk about how every car has to have a dowel on the front of it. Um, but that dowel is being used to measure the distance. Am I getting the question correct? Yes. Um, so uh, the the front of the car, if I sort of I don't know, draw this as our little car here, and it has its wheels on the sides. Um, and let's say that this is about where the car stopped. So it, you know, drove like this and it ended up here. Um, there will be a little dowel on the front of the car represented by that little dot. And we'll measure the distance from that dowel to the target point, which will represent your distance. Score. Wonderful, thank you very much. Okay, so let's move on. 
um, we are going to talk about construction. And uh, let's take, you have a couple of videos, I think, to show us the two common ways that people uh, that do this or create a vehicle of this sort. Right. So um, this event differs from Mousetrap Vehicle, if you did Mousetrap Vehicle last year, um, in that last year, Mousetrap Vehicle, all of the power for the car had to come from two mousetraps on the car. Um, this event is actually pretty similar to Mousetrap Vehicle um, in sort of the overall strategy and the overall goal. Um, the main difference is that your power isn't coming from mousetraps, it's coming from some other form of elastic energy. So um, there are a couple of different strategies that you could use here. Um, let me share my screen again. Um, <clears throat> So here we have a video of a team using a rubber band wrapped around an axle um, to generate the elastic energy that they are using to drive their car. Um, so it's a little hard to see. Maybe I'll let this run and then go back to the beginning to show you how it's working. Um, so here at the beginning, we can see that we have a rubber band anchored to a little hook here. And that rubber band stretches down the length of the car and it wraps around an axle a number of times. Um, and so before running the car, the team will wind up the rubber band around the axle to create tension. Um, and then when they release the car, um, the rubber band will pull on the axle, causing it to spin, which is what's driving the car forwards. Does that make sense? Um, and yeah, you can find these videos pretty easily if you just Google for, you know, Science Olympiad elastic vehicle videos, or if you go on YouTube or whatever. Um, I'll put these one... videos that you showed today also, I'll put them on the, um, I'll put them on that resource page of the wheel vehicle since mm -hmm. you showed them. Okay. Awesome. Um, and then we had one other video here, um, which is a similar, concept, but instead of using a rubber band, they have these two sort of flexible rods that are sticking up. Um, these also count. It's also elastic potential energy that's being stored in those flexible rods. So they have a string tied to those rods, and you can see that the rods are actually getting bent downwards, putting them under tension. Um, and then when they release them, the rods are going to want to, you know, restore to their original position. Um, which is what's going to drive the car forward. So let's skip forward a little bit. Here they have it under all under tension. Um, and then they're going to activate it. And you can see that it's moving pretty quickly. Cool. <laughs> Wonderful. So those are the two general commonly used kind of elastic energies. Uh, let's, uh, I'm looking, checking to see if we have any questions. No, nothing yet. So let's talk about the construction parameters, what you need to be paying attention to. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so we have on this uh, Virginia Science Olympiad website for the event, we have a document with construction parameters outlined, which I can share again. Um, so just to return to um, the event page on the Science Olympiad website, um, you can find the wheeled vehicle construction parameters PDF here. Um, I think that this is the VASO website. Sorry, the, the VASO website, yeah. Um, Virginia Science Olympiad website. Um, and we have a couple of slides here that show a couple of different views of sort of what the car should look like. Um, so from above, um, the entire car, uh, or rather the, the wheels of the car, um, need to fit within a 70 centimeter by 30 centimeter box. Um, so for the length of the car, we've shown that the, fr uh, the back of the back wheel to the front of the front wheel needs to be no more than 70 centimeters. And then for the width of the car, um, this includes the axles or like wheel hubs or anything that you might have sort of sticking off the end of the wheel here, um, like these things. And those have to fit within a 30 centimeter box. 
Okay, um, I'm going to ask you a question here. So, so yes, don't, and and to reiterate, don't forget the hubcaps or any parts of your axle that are sticking out. But if you were to build the car so that the wheels were on the inside of the frame, it's not really the width is not really a measurement for the wheels, right? Isn't it just a measurement for the whatever the maximum width? of the vehicle is whether it's wheels or the outside or whatever right i believe that's correct yeah so if, if you put the if you put the wheels on the inside of the car then the wheels would no longer be the outermost part of the car so you would still want to make sure that the width of the car was less than 30 centimeters but the but the car uh can overhang uh can overhang the wheels and and for the 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 length mm -hmm. that is just the wheels right that's my understanding. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. So in, in this diagram, we see that the front of the car here overlap or um, overhangs the front of the wheel a little bit. And that is OK, even if the wheels were 70 centimeters. Um, right. And then the other sort of critical thing here is that we have the dowel, um, which is more visible in the uh, in the um, side view of the car, which we'll look at in a second. Um, and just note that the dowel has to be the furthest forward part of the car. So this is the front of the car up here, and the dowel needs to be at the front of the car in front of the wheels, in front of the entire sort of chassis. Um, now, the, the dowel doesn't have to be, it's pictured in a particular spot here. We have a mm -hmm. question about this. Does the dowel need, as long as it's the most front part, does it have to be centered on this, you know, do, does it matter where on the front the dowel is? I know it doesn't matter. So here it's positioned sort of off to the side. You could put the dowel here. That would be fine. You could have something sticking out, like a little rod sticking out, and you could put the dowel up here. That would also be fine. So as long as it is the most forward part of the car, you're okay. If you put a rod, though, room, oh, actually, if you put a rod, it doesn't matter. It, well, the length, the length. A part of the vehicle didn't matter. Uh, right, exactly. Except the wheels. Um, the only thing that can be in front of the rod, uh, but when you attach a dowel, uh, you you know dowels don't float in space, so something probably has to be in front of the dowel. I mean, the dowel has to be the the foremost thing. So yeah. how do you attach a dowel? Yeah. So I, I forget the exact phrasing, but there is a line in the rules that says that something like the uh, dowel attachment mechanism can be in front of the dowel. So what they're sort of trying to get out there is um, if we look sort of down here, if we say that this here is our dowel and that it's at the front of our car, um, we're allowed to have something like, uh, you know, a rod here that sort of wraps around the dowel a little bit um, in order to hold it. Uh, you could have something with a hole drilled in it to stick the dowel into. Um, you could theoretically use a piece of tape to tape it on, although that probably is not the most secure option. Um, so there isn't anything super strict here, um, but know that you should not have more than maybe a millimeter or two of material in front of the dowel. Um, and the only material that should be in front of the dowel is material that's there just to hold the dowel in place and hold it in position at the front of the car. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, should we move on to the side view then? Uh, sure. So if we scroll down, we can see, I guess this is actually a front view, um, a front view but yeah. gives you a better idea of what the dowel should look like. So um, an important difference between uh, this year's event and past car events um, that you may have done, you may have heard about, is that the dowel has to be 20 centimeters tall or more. Um, the reason for this is that the dowel is what is actually going to be triggering the photo gate timer. So um, because the dowel is the most forward part of the car, it will be the first thing to cross through the photo gate. And then it'll again be the first thing to cross through the second photo gate ending the time. Um, and it's important that the dowel stick up 20 centimeters because the photo gate is going to be elevated off the ground. Um, and if it's too short, it may not trip the photo gate and you might not be able to get a time score. Um, so make sure that the entire dowel is 20 centimeters um, and that the dowel also needs to be quite close to the track floor when the car is in a resting position. 
So in this diagram, it says maximum one centimeter. Um, I might go for even less than this. Um, you want to keep relatively little space between the bottom of the dowel and the track. And the reason that this rule is in place is to make it easier to measure the distance between the car and the target point, because you really want to be able to see what point on the track the dowel is hovering above when the car comes to a complete stop. Um, so actually, actually, you know, I'm thinking about this a little bit before you move on. The mm -hmm. dowel, when you when you run the vehicle, the dowel is placed the 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 end of the dowel that's close to the track is called the measurement point right mm -hmm. which is why this has to be so <clears> close <throat> because they're measuring from the dowel to the to the target i actually think you know i'm looking at this i i, I admit it i made this diagram and i think mm -hmm. i made a mistake maybe the dowel really should be centered because when you start the run don't you have to start the run with the dowel on the uh on the starting dot Yep. So um, you do need to start the run with the dowel over the starting dot, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the dowel has to be centered. Um, the if if you don't have the dowel centered on the car, then the entire car will sort of be driving a little bit to the side of that imaginary center line, maybe. Um, but that's totally fine. Um, it's up to you to position the dowel however you want. Um, just know that if you go back to the track diagram. Um, really your goal in this entire event is to sort of get the dowel, get the, the measurement point on the dowel from the start point to the end point. And if, um, you know, if you have your car sort of like this, um, so that the dowel is off to the side, um, so you have the dowel sort of right here on the car, um, that's totally fine. It's just that your entire car would then drive a little bit to the side of the center line as it goes down the track so that it ended with the dowel as close to this target point as possible. Oh, I see. So it really doesn't matter. Okay, I was it starting to have a little bit of a, a kind of a brain fart there. Mm -hmm. As we go back to this, um, I, I'm noting there's a note here on, don't don't move on yet. So sure. the, the, the dowel is frequently forgotten or really <clears throat> Yeah. And that's a construction penalty. That's a big hit, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. So I, I don't remember the exact number of points that you'll be penalized if you don't have the dowel done correctly, um, but it is significant and it will, you know, significantly impact your ranking in the event. So um, this is definitely sort of a frustrating one to see as an event supervisor because you'll get a team who put a ton of work into their car and their car is really well designed and it drives very well on the track um, and maybe they've put a lot of time into testing it but they just don't have the right size dowel or their dowel isn't positioned at the front of the car or their dowel isn't close enough to the track and if any of those things happen we have to apply a construction penalty um, so please get this right um, you know make sure you measure and double measure your dowel to make sure that it's the right length and everything um, and make sure you read and reread the rules and pay attention to these diagrams to really understand what a correctly positioned dowel looks like. Because um, it shouldn't be a hard thing to, you know, it's three points in a sense. We we have, um, there is a clarification that the dowel has to be a quarter inch, you know, wooden dowel. <laughs> And uh, if you could go back to the to the VASO uh, wheel vehicle mm -hmm. page for just a sec, if you go up a little bit, you can see there's some clarifications here. The second one on October 9th is our acknowledgement that when you buy a quarter inch dowel, so normally we are very precise about measurements. Um, you know, and Ethan will tell you when you when he's when he's measuring that dowel to make sure it's within one centimeter of the floor. If it's a little over a centimeter, it's not good. You know, we we're always saying we're very precise in measurements, but we recognize that a, a dowel sold as a quarter inch dowel is not really it is slightly less than that. And Vaso recognizes that, and we don't need you to do some kind of weird. Buy a half inch dowel, find a lathe, and pare it down to a quarter inch. If you buy a dowel that is labeled a quarter inch dowel, we will understand that that is a quarter inch dowel. We're not going to be weird about that measurement. So that's what that clarification is about for those of you that work in wood and realize two by fours aren't really two by four and quarter inch dowels aren't a quarter inch and so forth. So, 
Um, can we go back now to the to the first page of the vehicle diagram that we were just on? So those that's a 70 centimeters is right. and actually maybe even a little longer than that because that's just the wheel base there. Mm -hmm. That's pretty long. Um, are most vehicles actually that long? No. So um wheeled vehicle is sort of a unique event in that the uh, size constraints that are given to you um, are not necessarily uh, sizes that you should really be going for. So that there are a lot of build events that you'll do in Science Olympiad where um, size constraints are meant to be pretty restrictive and you you really should take advantage of all the space you have. This is not one of those events. Um, I've seen very good vehicles that were only, you know, 25 centimeters long and 15 centimeters wide um, or, you know, something in that ballpark. So um, don't feel like you have to make your car 70 centimeters long. Um, it's not necessarily an advantage to have a longer car. And in fact, it may even be an advantage to have a shorter car. Um, that's something that you can play with. There are probably benefits and drawbacks to both. Well, length and, you know, is it, do you find in your experience, it's an advantage to have a heavier car? Or um, how do you play into that? Right. So again, there may be benefits and drawbacks to both. Um, I think generally, uh, the lighter your car, the faster it's going to be able to go. Um, because, you know, your input energy is probably going to be the same. Um, but if there's a lighter car, it has less inertia, it's easier to get the car going. Um, so if you're going for a really good speed score, then maybe a lighter car will be better. On the other hand, when you make a car lighter, you're also sacrificing some strength and stability. And so you don't want to build a car that's going to break. Um, you also don't want to build a car that's so light um, that it sort of wobbles or is, is unstable, and that maybe affects how well it can drive. Um, so you guys can play with these things. Um, and yeah, there are probably reasons to do both. Thank you. OK, so I know you had a third page in this exhibit. Um, I, I was keeping you from going there. <laughs> no, you're good. I mean, I, I don't even. Uh, right. So these are just some sort of other general warnings and notes. Um, there are no electronic um, components or devices that are allowed, except for a calculator. Um, if you want to do calculations about like how to line up your car um, when you're starting. Um, or how many all... times to wind your rubber band around the right. Probably exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, all propulsive energy must be stored in non-metallic elastic materials. So I, I talked about this non-metallic laws. Um, sort of in my intro as well. Uh, basically, this is saying you can't use a spring, right? Um, so when you guys, if you guys did mousetrap vehicle last year, um, mousetrap vehicles store their energy in two little metal springs or in, in one little metal spring on each mousetrap. Um, so for this event, you have to explicitly not use anything that's metal. Um, so things like rubber bands, wooden sticks, uh, you know, other sort of bendable rods are totally valid. Um, the activation trigger, I think we might talk a little bit more about in a little bit, um, but it's important that you're able to activate your trigger um, with only downward force using the um, eraser end of a number two pencil. So during an actual run of your event, you'll place your car on the track. Um, the event supervisor will give you an unsharpened number two pencil, um, and you will have to push down on some kind of switch or button or activation point with the um, with the eraser, which will start the car moving. Um, and that, the trigger can't be electric either. So don't right, think exactly. Right. Um, and the braking systems work automatically. So that means you can't have like a string attached to the car. Like it says no ramps, anchors, tethers, or other separate pieces. So you can't have like a string attached to the car that you're holding and you use to stop the car. Um, the car has to stop on its own. Um, and the only parts that, of the car that can contact the floor are the wheels and treads that are obviously touching the floor because they're what's driving the car. Um, drive strings. So in that first video that we watched, um, there was the rubber band that was wrapped around the axle. And then after the car started, the rubber band unwound itself from the axle and it was just sort of dangling and it was dragging along the floor. That's allowed. Um, that's considered a drive string, um, but that's one of the only things that you're, that's allowed to be touching the ground. So they also include propulsive energy elastics like the rubber band. 
um, and any parts are ready in contact with the floor and they're ready to run position. So theoretically, you could have another piece of the car that's sort of rubbing along the ground for some reason if you wanted to. Um, and as long as it started touching the ground, it could continue touching the ground as the car is driving. Wonderful. Thank you. That's really, really helpful. So let's talk about, um, is, in an, is there anything in particular that you'd like to say about the trigger? Um, yes. Yeah, so I think triggers can be a little bit tricky. Um, I don't have a ton of super concrete recommendations for it, um, except for get creative. There are definitely a bunch of different ways that you can do it. Um, just to give you an idea of what kinds of things you might be thinking about, um, one concept is maybe um, like having like a clothespin, like a wooden clothespin positioned on the car um, with uh, one end of a drive string or a rubber band or something um, inside of it. And so when you push on that, maybe it releases the rubber band or the drive string. Um, another thing you could think about is uh, holding the axle in place. So when you wrap a rubber band or a string around the axle, um, you're putting it under tension so that that wheel sort of wants to start turning. Um, but you could have some sort of mechanism in place that stops that axle from turning until you push a button, which allows the axle to start turning. Um, and there are probably a few different ways you could do that as well. Um, I've never actually done an event before myself that has one of these triggers um, because most of the, my time was spent on mousetrap vehicle, where usually the mousetrap was the trigger, um, or electric vehicle, which just had like a button to start the vehicle. Um, so I'll leave it up to you guys to come up with your own interesting designs, and I'm sure you guys have plenty of ideas that will work just fine for this. I would add one thing, though, that I have seen uh, is mm -hmm. just that making sure that the trigger doesn't jar your vehicle, right? You've gone to all right. this effort to line it up point it, you know, set it in the right spot to start. And then if you have to pound on it so that it jerks the vehicle or does something like that, you, you want it to be an easy release. So do be thoughtful about that. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we started about triggering. Let's take the other end, which I think is tricky. Let's talk about braking. The braking has right. to be automatic. And I know that there's mm -hmm. a pretty common way to do this, right? Yeah, so there, there may be a few different braking mechanisms out there. Um, but there is sort of one primarily primary strategy for braking, which applies to this event, and it applies to most of the vehicle events for Science Olympiad. And that's something called a wing nut braking system. Um, some of you guys may have already heard of this. Some of you guys may have seen vehicles that use this. Um, but I wanted to sort of demonstrate it and describe it a little bit, um, just to sort of put everyone on level playing fields. Um, so the, I have a couple of videos here. Um, I guess just one video that sort of demonstrates how this works. Let me share my screen. Um, so the basic concept behind a wing nut braking system is that as a threaded axle or threaded dowel rotates, um, it can cause a nut that is on that axle to move up and down the axle. So if I play this video, um, the person is spinning the wheel. And when they spin it, you can see that this wing nut here travels up and down the axle. And the reason it's able to travel up and down the axle is because there's this wooden bar um, that's going across the car right here, which blocks this wing of the wing nut and prevents it from rotating around the axle. Um, and so because the wing nut can't rotate with the axle as the axle spins, the wing nut is moving up and down the length of the axle. So and it's a finally, threaded rod, the axle's a threaded rod. Right, then. exactly. This is sort of like a big screw um, with, with, you know, screw threads on it. So when this wing nut uh, finally reaches the end of the axle and it hits whatever the sort of wheel casing is over here, it stops moving because it doesn't have anywhere to go. It can't rotate, and it also can't continue moving down the axle. Um, and so, as you can see in the video, this brings the car to a pretty abrupt stop. Um, let me clear all drawings. Let me just play it one more time. So it's moving down the length of the axle, gets to the end, and you can see that the wheels just sort of jerk to a stop and are, are dead. Um, oh, here's a more zoomed in version of what's happening. 
Um, and again, I think Karen said that these videos will be linked from the VASO website if you want to take a look. Um, so the idea with the wing nut braking system is that this is what will control the stopping of the car. And this also provides a mechanism for setting your distance. So um, depending on where the wing nut is positioned along the length of the axle to start out with, it will have further or not as far to travel down the length of the axle before it gets to the end. So by adjusting the starting position of this wing nut, you can set up your car to travel different specific distances. And this is how you'll calibrate your car to be able to hit different target points, depending on what the target point is set at. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions. I don't see any questions on that. Let's talk about um, sourcing good wheels. Yeah, so I think you can definitely get creative with your wheels. Um, something that's really important to think about is wheel size. Um, this is definitely an event where your knowledge of simple machines and mechanical advantage will come into play. So you can think about big wheels versus small wheels and what might be the benefits and drawbacks of each. Um, and I'd encourage you to experiment with different size of wheels. In terms of what to actually use for wheels, um, I think there are lots of things that you can just sort of source from your house or from a hardware store or something that would work fine as wheels. Um, a lot of people try to use CDs as wheels and you totally can do that. And I've seen lots of successful cars that have used CDs. CDs can be a little bit tricky because they're so narrow. It can be hard to get them to be aligned straight on the car um, and it can be hard to get them to be stable on the car. Um, and also CDs are generally one very specific size. So if you determine that, that size is either too big or too small, um, then you might want to look at other, other types of wheels. Um, there is a manufacturer of plastic sort of wheels um, that's called Bainbots. Bainbots is the name of the manufacturer. Um, and if you watch a lot of videos of these sorts of events, you'll see that a lot of teams are using the same kind of wheel um, on their cars. Um, Bainbots wheels are not super expensive. I think you can get a set of the wheels for your car for maybe like $20 or $30. Um, so if you'd like to go for that, you're welcome to. Um, but I don't want to create the impression that these are the only kind of wheels that you can be successful with. Um, you can definitely find success with lots of different types of wheels. So try things out, get creative. Do you want you? Um, I, I noticed that the braking mechanism jerked the, the wheels a little bit. So do you want the, the wheels to be a little like sticky or just to have a little bit of a grip so that, that it doesn't go skidding across the floor when the brake hits? Right. So you, you definitely do want good grip on your wheels. Um, you'll see that a lot of teams that end up using CDs will try to create grip on the CDs by um, using like a rubber balloon that they wrap around the CDs or maybe a, a wide rubber band or something. Um, and the idea is that you want something with more friction than just like the edge of a CD. Um, not only will it be hard to stop accurately if you don't have good grip, um, you'll find that it'll also be difficult to start the car without good grip because the wheels may just sort of spin in place instead of actually getting traction on the floor and causing the car to move forward. Um, so yeah, definitely good traction is important. So, so there's two parts to a score here. There's the, the accuracy, essentially, and the speed. Um, they have official names and rules, but that's essentially yeah. it. Is there, do you have a suggestion about the emphasis in this, about where to put, you know, what to focus on more? Are they equally balanced? Mm -hmm. I see the time score is too time. I, you know, so what do you think yeah. about that? Yeah, so I'd always encourage teams to focus on the distance score. Um, most of the time, the, the distance score. Mean? The accuracy? Yeah, right. So the, the distance score is how close you are to the target point, how accurate your car is. Um, so if, if you look at the, the scoring system that's outlined in the rules, um, again, your score, barring any penalties, um, is the distance score, which is just the number of centimeters that your car is from the target point at the end, um, plus uh, two times the number of seconds that it took for your car to traverse the, the timed portion of the track. Um, now that sounds like they're weighting the time score more heavily because they're multiplying the time score by that factor of two. 
in reality, a centimeter is pretty small, um, especially at sort of the state level. Um, if you're able to get your car, you know, within 10, 15, 20 centimeters, that's probably going to be a really good run. That's going to be a really accurate run. Um, and so it's definitely uh, good to focus on getting the car as close to the target point as possible over trying to make the car really fast. Because even if the car is super, super speedy, um, if it misses the target point by, say, 50 centimeters, that's going to be worse than a car that was slow but was just 10 centimeters away. Um, so prioritize accuracy. And then what I'd suggest is once you feel like you have your car very accurate, then you can start thinking about how can I make this a little bit faster to just get that extra little bit um, onto my score. And at that point, you start thinking about how can I make the car lighter weight? How can I store a little bit more force in the rubber band or the string or a little bit more energy in the rubber band or the string, um, et cetera. And you can start trimming down in your time. I'm guessing too that that there's not as much variation in the time, right? right? There's really only so fast that you can make this vehicle, but you can be really accurate or you can be terribly two meters inaccurate kind of right. thing. Mm -hmm. And we see vehicles that are several meters off of the target, right? Right, so, exactly. Okay. Yeah, um, exactly. Let's talk for a minute about kits, mm -hmm. if you don't mind. Uh, can we go back to the, uh, to the VASO, the, to the wheeled vehicle page and show the um, clarification we have about kits. Um, this one. Yes, yeah. that one. Mm -hmm. So, could you cover what we're what we're talking about here about kits? Um, right. So the rule clarification says um, it adds to Rule Four B Four. Um, if a kit was used to build the team's device, the design log must also include an explanation of at least one substantial modification made to the kit as required by the constructed devices policy. So essentially what we're saying for Virginia Science Olympiad um, is that you're welcome to use a kit, but you need to modify it in some way so that it is your own original work and you're not just using the kit as it came. Um, so kits have always been a little bit of a sticky subject with regards to Science Olympiad. Um, there are some pretty good kits out there that are built for different events. I'm not sure if anyone's built um, a kit that you can actually buy for wheeled vehicle yet, but um, obviously the point of Science Olympiad is for students to exercise their creativity, put their design skills into practice, um, think about what makes an effective design. And so if you decide to use a kit, um, you need to modify the kit in some way, in some substantial functional way that in your mind improves its performance or change it, changes its performance in a significant manner. Um, and we're also asking for teams to submit a design log along with their vehicle, which just talks about how they went about designing and building their vehicle. Um, and if you chose to use a kit, you need to make sure that whatever changes you made to the kit are clearly documented in the design log so that the event supervisor is able to look at those and understand what your thought process was and your design process was when you attempted to improve that kit. I note, um, you know, as a person who's, who's dealt with this at a more global level of VASO, that um, oh, I, I see somebody asking, do we have a practice and design log for the event? Yes, there is one. And what mm -hmm. goes in it is outlined in the rules. Uh, we're not going to cover that in a lot of detail other than to say we have it, you know, we want you to add this piece to your design log. But um, kits, kits can be, kits are a starting point, right? Um, and, and then really you need to make these, because a kit, it does not guarantee, does not guarantee a medal. Uh, some kits aren't legal. You need to make sure that all the parts, even, even kits that say Science Olympiad on them may not actually be legal based on the rules. So it's your responsibility to check that and make sure. Um, so, so Ethan, tell me, like give me a couple examples of something that's not a substantial modification. Right, so a big thing is any sort of cosmetic change. Um, if yeah. you, you know, paint your car a different color or you, um, you know, modify the appearance of the car in some way without actually changing how it works, 
Um, like if you, you know, attach something to the car that's just there for decoration, does not count as a significant change. Um, another thing would be replacing the dowel on the car. Or you um, mean adding the dowel. Or, or adding a dowel, right. So you, you might have some kits that come with all of the parts of the car except for the dowel. Um, and then you just have to stick your own dowel in there. If that's the only change you've made, that doesn't count as a significant change. So in order to be a significant change, it has to actually affect how the car performs on the track, how it drives, how it stops, um, how it's triggered. Um, something about the actual functioning features of the car has to be changed or improved or modified um, in order for it to work. Essentially, and I liked you had you said this, so I'm going to say it again. It, there has to be reasoning behind it where you think you're making a change that's going to make it operate better. Right. So, right. And just an additional note, students need to put the design log together themselves. They will be asked about the information in it. So uh, that's always kind of a, a concerning thing when a student doesn't know what's in their own design log. So students put together the design log and by by all means, you know, me event mentors, you're, you could suggest and talk them through it and help them figure out how to format it and what should go in there. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I would say all this is true about if you choose to 3D print a design, there's some there's some guidelines in the rules too about what should go in the log if you choose to 3D print um, a design as well. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. All right, so where do where do people uh, go wrong? <laughs> uh, sorry, can you can you clarify the question? Um, where do they go wrong in? Right. Um, in, in building the vehicle. I'm sorry. We're, we're right, moving on from vehicle. kids now. Sure, sure. Um, so, yeah. So I think there are lots of mistakes that people make. Um, a big one is getting the car to be able to drive straight. Um, so just having a car that can drive and stop at a specific distance is not always enough. Um, remember that that target point is along the center line with the start point. Um, and so making a car that is able to stay close to that center line so that when it stops at the appropriate distance, it's also very close to the target point is very important. Um, and doing that often comes down to making sure that the weight on your car is balanced, um, that the axles are properly aligned. Um, if you have one of your axles tilted a little bit, your car is going to be going off to the side. Um, you want to make sure that the wheels are securely attached to your axles. You don't want wheels falling off. You don't want wheels wobbling. Um, you want to make sure that wheels are attached uh, in such a way that they're aligned properly and that they're straight and that they're not um, sort of at an angle. Um, you want to make sure you get the dowel right, as I talked about. Um, so ensure that you have a dowel, ensure the dowel is the correct length, um, that it's a quarter inch dowel, and that it starts less than a centimeter above the track. Um, I and that it's the, attaching the dowel at a couple points. Mm -hmm. The dowel also needs to be stable because if it's doing this when it when the car goes, then mm -hmm. you're not you don't have a stable time or a good stable measurement point. So attach the dowel in two spots rather than just one where it can can be wobbly. Yeah, for sure. Making sure the dowel doesn't fall off in the middle of a run as well. If the, if the dowel falls off, then your run doesn't count. So or you're, you get a construction penalty for that, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe it's a competition penalty. I should look that up. I think it's the construction. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then I think really one of the biggest things, or maybe the biggest thing, in my opinion, is starting early and testing a lot. So um, we mentioned that all teams are going to have to submit a practice log. Um, the rules say that the practice log should have at least, I think it's like 10 runs on it. Um, you probably need a lot more than 10 runs. Um, you know, 10 runs should be seen as sort of like a bare minimum, uh, but really um, you know, a very effective car needs to be tested very thoroughly. Even if you've built the best car in the world, if you don't know exactly how to set up the car in order to get the best results, then you're going to still be getting pretty mediocre results. So testing is about collecting data um, on, you know, how many rotations should I put on my axle in order to get it to break at the correct distance? It's also about going through the motions and understanding, um, okay, when my eight minutes begin um, at the competition, these are the things I'm gonna have to do. I'm gonna have to 
um, set up the vehicle by twisting the, the axle this many times. I'm going to have to position the vehicle at exactly this angle. Um, and I'm going to have to, you know, launch the vehicle um, without, you know, jostling it as I'm starting the vehicle and making sure that you've practiced the stuff so that when you get to the competition, it feels like second nature um, and you've done a million times and you also have seen some of the things that can go wrong and you know how to address them in the moment, that's going to be super important. So build, 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 and then test, 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 and get started on testing as early as you can. Now, you told me that you had a favorite resource for this event. So do you want to share that? Sure. Um, so uh, it's funny. I was actually just looking at it this morning, and there isn't a ton up there right now. Um, but there's a website called SciLE.org, um, which some of you may have heard of and may have used before. Um, and SciLE.org is essentially a big online forum, um, which is used by middle school and high school students across the country to discuss different science Olympiad events and the different strategies that they're using and talk about um, the different scores that they've been able to earn in different events and compare scores and talk about what's been working and what hasn't been working. Um, I believe uh, SciLE is linked from the VASO website. So if I share my screen again, um, we're back here on the wheeled vehicle page for Virginia Science Olympiad, and down at the bottom, there's the Student Resource Center SciLE link. Um, this brings us to the SciLE website, and then under Build Events, Wheeled Vehicle B, we have the forum for Wheeled Vehicle. At the moment, there's very little up here. There's only been like two posts and not a lot of people talking. Um, but I encourage you guys to start the discussion. Um, if you ask a question up here, you might get someone to, to answer it. Another thing you can do is go back and look at SciLE threads from past years. So you could go back and look at the last year that, um, that Wheels Vehicle was an event, and you could look at the discussion that was going on that year. Be careful when you do that, because the, wheel, the rules for the event may have changed. So just because somebody says something about the rules or says something about a design for a past year doesn't necessarily mean that it applies to this year, but it still might be helpful for getting inspiration and seeing what the different strategies people use are. And you can also look at threads for other similar events. So I believe Scrambler is an event for Division C this year. Um, a lot of the same techniques and strategies apply to Scrambler as apply to wheeled vehicles. So you might be able to get some inspiration from that as well. Um, definitely a good thing to take a look at, and I'd encourage you to just familiarize yourself with this website in general. It is a good tool, and you can get to it from every event page on the VASA website. Um, we're, we're wrapping up here. Just a few minutes um, on what do we need, uh, what does the event look like on tournament day, and what are some common mistakes that people make on tournament day? Sure. Um, so this is an impound event. Um, uh, we didn't do impound last year because we had sort of the special setup with COVID and um, people only competing in build events in person. Um, but impound basically means that you'll be turning in your vehicle to the event supervisors early in the morning of, on the day of the competition. Um, and you won't be able to touch your vehicle again until it's actually your time to compete. Um, so... This is so that we can check off some basic um, parameters of vehicles before the event and make sure that they comply um, with various construction parameters um, and make sure that you do impound because if you forget to impound your vehicle, um, you may not be allowed to compete later in the day. Are you um, the penalty? The, um, oh, okay. And I would also say it's important to read in the rules exactly what should be impounded because sometimes it's not just the vehicle it might be like you're, you'll be impounding your practice log as well too and additional spare parts so that's written clearly in rule 2a what what needs to be impounded and if you don't impound those things you won't be allowed to use you know if you if you want to impound a few spare parts or an alignment device or something and you forget to impound it you won't be allowed to use it okay right, exactly mm -hmm. Um, and then this is also a safety goggle required event, um, as are most build events, maybe all build events. Um, so make sure you bring safety goggles with you and you wear them for the whole time. Um, event supervisors have to enforce that. Um, so if you don't have safety goggles with you, you won't be allowed to compete. Um, and this is also an event where it really does make sense. Um, if you have, you know, 
rods or rubber bands under a lot of tension and something breaks, then you could have, you know, pieces of wood <laughs> flying around or whatever. Um, and, you know, you don't want to damage an eye. So make sure you wear goggles and make sure you wear goggles for testing as well. Um, and yeah, there's some other things specified in the rules about the actual competition that you are not allowed to do. So you're not allowed to roll your vehicle on the track um, at any time on the competition day, um, like without permission from the event supervisor, but I don't think we're gonna be giving permission. So don't try and like come down early and see what the track is like and practice on there or something. You're not gonna be allowed to do it. Um, well, there's, there's another side of that too, mm -hmm. right? Like I think the temptation you get, what is it two runs two runs i think it's two runs, yeah. the better of the two runs um so the temptation would be you know to run it the first time and then on the second run wind up your wing nut breaking by rolling it backwards on the track mm -hmm. and that would give you a very precise measurement of where the wing nut should be that is not allowed you have to calculate and set that so th this is that's the other facet of why you don't get to roll your vehicle on the track you don't get to do it to set any parameters of the vehicle running. Gotcha. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, you're also not allowed to follow the vehicle down the track. Once you release the vehicle, you have to stay where you are and just watch it go um, and make sure that you don't immediately run and pick up your vehicle as soon as it's done. Um, this is something that you actually see a lot is teams, you know, have either a good run or maybe a run that they're not so happy with and they're anxious to immediately start setting up for the next run. So they like immediately run over to the car, look at how they did and then pick up the car and run back. Um, you're not allowed to do that because the event supervisors need to uh, be able to get your measurement and see how well you did and score you. Um, don't worry, we will pause the timer um, when the car stops. So we will, um, you have a limited amount of time to do your two runs. I think it's eight minutes or something. Um, so don't, don't worry about uh, the measure, the time that the event supervisors spend measuring your distance, eating away from your eight minutes. Um, yeah, and then I think it's just general excitement too. Yeah, right? general excitement. the kids are excited and they're nervous, and this may be their first tournament. This is a Division B event, so just mm -hmm. just keep kind of encouraging the kids that they they should just wait, wait, wait at the starting line until the mm -hmm. event supervisor tells them not to, because yeah, it's a it is a penalty. So. <laughs> Yeah. And then one other point that we have here, um, if your vehicle manages to pass the 0 0.25 meter line, which is where the timer starts, um, but for some, for whatever reason, it fails to pass the second line, the 0 0.75, or the, the 7.25 meter line, um, that I believe counts as a competition violation. Um, we will still do our best to score you. Um, we'll stop the timer when the car stops moving and then we'll measure from wherever the car is. Um, but you will also have a competition penalty incurred on top of your score. I think I'm at the end of my list of questions. I'm gonna give it just a few seconds to see if anybody else has any questions that they'd like to, to add to this. I don't see any. Ethan, thank you. You've been amazing this morning. This was just so helpful, gave us so many ideas, showed us so, so much. I really, we are very grateful for your time. Thank you so much, Ethan. Yeah, no problem. Thank you as well. Have a good one.